All right. Thank you very much, Mr. McMullock, President of the Open Society. Thank you very much for making time to talk to, um, to me. Um, just briefly, what's this trip about here? Well, Kenya has been the center of a lot of our African operations as the Open Society Foundations for many years. So we're actually just restructuring those operations, you know, after the long absence because of COVID. Uh, it's for me in my role as president of OSF, my first trip to Africa since COVID, and I'm thrilled it's starting in Kenya. It uh, goes on to South Africa, but it starts here. And um, for me, that's right. Over many, many, many visits to Africa over the years, having served in the British government, uh, dealing with Africa, having served at the UN and the World Bank, dealing with Africa, you know, Kenya is always a good place to start. There is sort of like a global movement from the pandemic then to economic upheavals, and we are seeing all these governments that are winning office, they are right-wing governments, and right-wing politics is sort of sweeping across Europe. And it sort of has an effect on what happens elsewhere, like in Kenya here. What do you, what's happening in global politics? It's a mess. There is a huge authoritarian tide, uh, which has meant that you know, the number of full democracies in the world has been steadily retreating every year for the last 15 years or so. Uh, and you know, that means that ordinary citizens' lives are less free. Uh, and at the same time that they are politically less free, we've more recently been running into strong economic headwinds as well. Uh, rising levels of inequality in countries, return, according to the World Bank's latest estimates, uh, to higher levels of absolute poverty in the world. The, we'd assume that by 2030, only 3% of the world would live in extreme poverty. Instead, they're now saying 7%, and that's because we've lost a decade because of COVID. And if you look more qualitatively, you know, a country like Kenya, which has made such a push on primary and secondary education in recent decades. Well, you know, it's part of a global story that actually the levels of illiteracy across the world of boys and girls who are at the age of 10 still don't have basic uh, reading, writing, counting skills. Those numbers are growing in an alarming way. Uh, and so, you know, this, these are difficult times. Well, we just come from an election. The new government is literally 30 or so days in, and we have seen in the last three years of this campaign, sort of like a prolonged campaign that measured on the question of the economy as opposed to social justice. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, look, you had a very l low turnout in your election, and I think in some ways, you know, what you're seeing in Kenya, you see across much of the continent and other parts of the world as well, a, you know, a, a little bit of a demographic division of younger people not really feeling that democracy is delivering for them. And a lot of older people too saying, why bother to turn out to vote? Is it really going to make a difference? And that, that sense of frustration and uh, cynicism towards uh, elections is, is very widespread. You know, uh, you saw it in the extraordinary circumstances of the last presidential election in the US. You know, in the UK, you see it in people's amazement at the way the ruling party, you know, with a minute number of people actually as members of it is, you know, changing leaders more often than most of us change shirts. Uh, and, um, you know, it all adds up to a sense that you know, our politics isn't working for us all. It's not necessarily uh, delivering the kind of accountable governments, which, government which are dealing with the issues that matter to us as, as fathers and husbands and as indeed mothers and, and, and wives, that, you know, our family's security is not improving, um, that there's you know, difficulties in the provision of health and of education, jobs are not always available, often they're not, you know, paying the kind of wages people were used to getting. And so it's a very choppy and turbulent time, and, you know, our politics reflects that. There's some sort of a prevailing criticism on the civil society that in the last 10 or 15 years, something has happened. The civil society has focused on 
governance and accountability and human rights as opposed to this urgent problem that is sort of the economic justice. And, and that has happened and it's played out in our politics as well. Look, I think there's some significant validity about it. And, you know, in a way, though, I mean, the human rights community is, is you know, it hasn't got its head in the sand. It's always had this debate about how to balance economic and social rights against political and civil. But I think there is a sense that it's, it's, it's missed the real narrative. Uh, and that, um, but, you know, equally, uh, to be honest, you know, to prevail on the economic uh, agenda, it needs accountable government. Um, you know, if you just l rely on economics alone, you get a sort of, you know, race to the bottom economics or a, you know, law of the jungle economics or whatever the metaphor you want to, to use. And so, you know, strong economies which are inclusive and provide that economic security for everybody are well-governed economies, well-regulated economies with a government which is focused not just on, you know, ensuring transparency and fairness and the rule of law in how uh, the economy operates and proper regulation of it, but also on an appropriate redistributive character that, you know, the poor don't get left behind, that there is proper tax revenue turned into decent public services to provide for people. And, you know, that, that formula has been breaking down in a lot of countries. Government seems to have been captured by elites uh, who are working for themselves and their, their friends and not for wider society. This criticism that open society is solely there to fund the opposition so that they take over governments. And that has gone forth, you know, with your founder, George Soros and the Sun, and the criticism has gone from the West, you know, to the North, the South. What do you have to say about that? Well, look, I think at the core of it, um, you know, is that open society is not about one political party or one candidate over another. It's about building societies where every voice can be heard and respected, where truth, or the nearest you can get to truth, comes out of critical debate amongst people who disagree and may the best ideas win. And that's always been our core philosophy. It's not, it's not a party political philosophy. Uh, it's not about individual candidates over another candidate. It's about seeding that debate. Now, why do people therefore think we're so often on the side of the opposition? Because we're on the side of, you know, all voices that are raised in opposition to governments, which, if you like, are kind of authoritarian and believe they have some kind of monopoly of the truth, some monopoly of communications. And our job is to bring different voices into that debate, often voices we don't agree with. So philosophically, we've never been about you know, um, revolution in that sense. But I think just more practically, you know, it, it, it's our critics are, you know, in a sense, they've been smoking something because, you know, revolutions and overthrows of governments don't come because one nice foundation, uh, you know, has given a grant to a handful of grantees. It tends to be a uh, longer tale or backstory to that kind of revolutionary change. And in 99% of the times, it's a domestically generated backstory. It's about leaders who've stayed too long in office, who've, you know, so obviously been, you know, stealing from the state to benefit themselves and their families, leaders who promote ideologies which increasingly alienate younger voters, you know, and you see it at the moment in Iran, to just cite the example of the week. Uh, but, you know, in many other countries too, all the uh, young Russians who fled into Kazakhstan to avoid being, you know, called up into Putin's army in, in recent weeks as well. You know, it's, it's these domestic causes of, of opposition which over time turn into political movements that in turn, you know, overthrow regimes. It's, it's not our important, but in that sense, you know, on the on the touch lines, support to 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 different voices uh, in these political debates. All right, Mr. Mark. Having said all I've said, 
if you were to run for office again, this time with the new realities, you know, the economic upheavals, the question of you know, economic justice and injustice across the world, the rise of the right wing, if you were to run for office again, how do you run for office again as a young man with all the realities that we have today? Well, you know, I, I, I think in a strange way, um, you know, it's, 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 I, I've been toying in my fantasies, I think of writing a novel about the upcoming American presidential election where you've got two old men likely to sort of once more stagger into the ring together. Mm -hmm. You know, the one who's, you know, a cap being captured by his uh, progressive left and who is losing the votes in the center, and the other who leads a kind of crazy right-wing faction of lunatics like himself, um, and yet, you know, leaving this massive space in the middle. And, you know, it really is the case that while America may be the extreme, that our politicians generally have lo lost touch with the great base of their citizens. They've lost the ability to cast a message around bringing straightforward economic benefits to people's lives, uh, opportunity to the, them and their families. And, you know, that sort of message of what in the West we call class interest as against the politics of culture, which is an identity which has become so overwhelming, uh, particularly in, in the US, but in many countries in Europe as well, and one starts to see shaping up here too, um, you know, is, is, is something that my generation of political leaders would want to sort of reverse and cut through and go back to a much more straightforward politics where uh, the champions of workers were up against the champions of the owners of capital and land and may the best side win. Absolutely, which seems to be supporting you primarily, by the way. <laughs> I, now, the, I, I'll, give you, I'll reveal any secret about politics, but no, never about soccer, it's football. Exactly. Yeah, no, listen, I mean, I was uh, very involved as a minister for Africa uh, in the aftermath of the Kenyan election of 2007-8, just like so many friends of Kenya were. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, ultimately a, a reasonable outcome was achieved because there was clarity about what had actually happened in the vote, um, or relative clarity. Uh, when I look at the complexity of the way social media was deployed in the last election, you know, I see that you know, a lot of the sort of straightforward institutions around vote count, both by the government and by civil society opponents, or, or observers rather, you know, that that whole structure has become many times more complicated because of the exploitation by politicians now of this sort of highly fragmented uh, partisan social media environment. So it's gotten a lot more complicated in the last 10 years or so. Well, as a recovering journalist from earlier in my career, I still believe that you know, independent, high quality journalism is one of the most important you know, protectors, institutional protectors of open society and democracy. So I think there is a huge need to, de to, to evol evolve models of journalism which are financially sustainable in this new world. It means obviously a lot more digital uh, journalism than in the past, um, but we have to find financial models which work which is incredibly difficult against free social media. Uh, but you know, we've somehow got to persuade people that the value of properly sourced, properly, you know, properly researched, uh, properly curated news you know, improves their choices as citizens versus just whatever go comes across the social media transom to them. So it's a fight about values and culture, it's a fight about education, but it's also a fight about creating sustainable media models because the independent journalist has become a more, not less important
you know, figure in the fight for open society. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mark Malone, the president of the Open Society of Kenya, for spending time talking to us around the question of politics, global upheavals, and the question of civil society and the centrality of independent journalism around all this. Thank you very much for making time.